Thank you, brother. I don't have a, I don't necessarily have a text tonight, but I had him read that again, even though I know we've been through it here recently. But uh, that chapter is so great, and it talks a little bit about uh, some, uh, you know, some false prophets, false teaching that's in there, and then some people that think they're going to heaven based on their works. And it's just a great passage, and it comes up in some of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight. So I had him read that, but this is more of a topical message on lordship salvation, lordship salvation. And, and uh, literally yesterday is when I decided to preach this. And I'm not I'm not even going to scratch the surface because there's so much that needs to be said and so much studying and stuff that needs to go in there. Individuals who have uh, taught this false doctrine that need to kind of be uh, exposed and and stuff like that. And so I'm going to just follow the leadership of the Lord on that and see where where this goes. Uh, But I wanted to just start tonight by introducing the subject and the title of the message is the hypocrisy of the Lordship Salvation Crowd. The hypocrisy of the Lordship Salvation crowd. Now, let me first explain. I got a lot to cover, but we're just going to, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to first explain to you why it's became so evident to me that I needed to address this and I wanted to work with it. I know that we're on the same page in here, but the teaching is creeping into independent Baptist circles like right. crazy. Yeah, that's right. and, uh, and it's really just, it's kind of just wearing me down. And it's like when I see it, and I'm like, surely they don't think what that sounds like they think. And so then I start asking them questions about that. And I'm like, it's worse than I thought <laughs> what they are believing about salvation. And this is a really, really big deal. And so let me tell you how this started. Um, first, I read on Facebook somebody who shares a lot of quotes from different individuals. And he's an independent Baptist uh, preacher uh, who I'm not going to necessarily name right now uh the time might come where that's necessary but uh i'll just tell you some of the things that he talked about okay and the quote that he posted i'm just gonna read you a part the very first part of this quote it was a long long quote but the very first part was and this is from aw tozer and here's what it said uh and by the way i'm one of these sermons will be directly i mean specifically on aw tozer because i have a lot to say about him but i'm not going to get into it uh, tonight but here was the quote aw tozer it says this Not everyone agrees with me that full qualification for eternity is not instant or automatic or painless. All right. So then he begins to say what he believes. And then he like kind of like bullies you into saying, well, surely you believe this and that. And then he tries to make you feel stupid if you don't believe what he believes. But I want to read that to you again. It says not everyone agrees with me that full qualification for eternity is not important, I mean, not instant or automatic or painless. And so I, I couldn't help it. I had to respond to that, and I said, he's right. I don't agree with him. <laughs> I don't agree with him all. I said the only pain that it caught, the, 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 the cost is in terms of pain was paid for by Christ. Amen. He was the one who did the pain. He was the one who met the qualifications. We don't meet any of the qualifications. Amen. And he's like, anybody that, uh, you know, uh, there, not everyone agrees with me, and I'm saying that's absolutely right. And I posted that on there, and I said I don't agree with them, and I and I basically said what I just said. That comment was instantly deleted, and then he ended up uh, having a private conversation with me, and he said, uh, "I'm not going to debate you on Facebook, where I basically what he means is where everybody's everybody's watching." And I'm not saying he's a, a coward for that or anything, and I'm glad he was still willing to talk to me uh, a little bit more more privately. But I can I can pretty much say this stuff that he put privately, he would not have wanted to put publicly. And that's probably why he deleted my comment. And and again, I'm not my purpose isn't to call him out, call him names. But what he's teaching is really, really bad. And people can't people can't uh, uh, get sucked into this. Okay, and so I'm just giving you as by way of introduction. Uh, what made me start thinking about this? Just some of the things that he said, and I'll share some some things from that uh, from that conversation in a minute. But then that same day, this was all yesterday, okay? Yesterday morning that began in Missouri, and he texted me and said, uh, you know, the subject of lordship salvation came up with him, and, uh, and and he was wanting to know if there were some messages on that or something like that. And uh, we began talking a little bit. And I said, that's funny because, you know, right after this conversation, I have just been saying, I think I need to preach on it. And I've been saying for a while I need to preach on 
some different things, especially in, in regards to A.W. Tozer and some different things that I've studied and found out. And then he, he sends me that text. And, I, and, and so we started talking a little bit and he sent me this link. And he said he and this other preacher were having this conversation. He said, and this was the link uh, that came up that he wanted to uh, kind of like uh, prove that it was wrong. If that makes sense, like somebody sends something, hey, this is basically what I believe. And so he looks at that and says, man, there's this guy quotes a lot of scripture. You know, how can I combat that? Because I know it's not right. And so I want to read to you that this article that he sent me. Again, this is certainly isn't something he believed. This is just a, a, an article that somebody else wrote. Has anybody ever seen something uh, from an, uh, a website called gotquestions.org? I don't know the guy's name, but yeah. oftentimes it's like a quick go to if you want to know the basic teachings of a certain doctrine or something like that. Uh, and, you know, it looks to me like he follows MacArthur, John MacArthur, Calvinistic and he's very big on lordship, salvation. Everything he explains to me seems like they're coming from the same from that school, which most of this rising, you know, Ray Comfort, uh, John MacArthur. I mean, you know. Paul Washer, which is kind of like an extreme of that, <laughs> you know, all these people uh, uh, that you see online, a lot of them are preaching this. And we, we, we have people in our circles, missionaries even, who are saying, you know, you know, they, they give the gospel using the same plan that Ray Comfort gives. And I'm thinking, do you guys even know what Lordship Salvation is right, and what right. it teaches? And I'll tell you this. Here's the problem with exposing any false doctrine is that there's always a mixture of truth in false doctrine. There's a little bit of truth in it. And so that makes it really hard. The devil loves to do that. You put enough truth in there where someone says, oh, man, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe it's pretty good. Well, I never really thought about that. And before you know it, they start chewing on that and thinking about that. And they begin to be convinced in the false doctrine. When I talk about the charismatic movement, the same thing. There's certain things. Hey, God is a God of miracles. God does do the supernatural. And so you can see where somebody would just put a little bit of truth in that. And then they would blow it up into a full out uh, false doctrine. Well, I, I tried to think of a way to illustrate this, and this isn't good. I could have come up with something better, I'm sure. But I think of it kind of like this salvation, the Bible uses the words in terms of salvation over and over grace of God, right? Which means it's a free gift. That's what grace is talking about, right? If you get a grace period, like on your rent, you're renting a building, and they say, I'm going to give you a grace period. You didn't do anything to earn that. What that means is I'm giving you free rent. <laughs> I'm giving you a grace period. You don't have to pay for this X amount of time. We know the word grace is talking about free. And then the other word that's used a lot is faith. Therefore, we have, you know, for by grace are you saved through faith. All right, those come together. By faith, you trust in Christ. You believe in uh, that he is uh, who he says he is in the Bible. And then, uh, and then by the grace of God, you know, he's given us that gift of salvation, and we're saved. And so on one hand, you have... Grace, you have faith, uh, all these things are required for uh, salvation. Now, you've got some people that don't believe in Jesus at all. Uh, they don't believe the Bible. They don't believe, uh, you know, even if they say they do, they really don't. They're not in this category I'm talking about, okay? They're somewhere out there. But in this category, you have those who believe in grace. They believe that it's just faith in Jesus Christ. It's grace and he saves you, right? Those are the ones who can be saved, you know, probably are saved. If, if their answer is, you know, hey, how do you know you're going to heaven? Only by the grace of God, because of what Jesus did. And I put my faith in Jesus. Those are people I'm thinking pretty pro probably saved, right? right? And you got this crowd over there that is work salvation. Now you have some people that just flat out, and you got to obey the Ten Commandments. You got to do this. You got to live for the Lord with all your own heart. And they don't even mention Jesus. How many times you knock on the door where that's right. the case? Yep. You know, even Baptists <laughs> who have said, well, you just got to live for the Lord, love your neighbors, do good. And I'm thinking, why did Jesus even die if you can get to heaven on your own works? But you can't. Right. And that's the message of the Bible. Okay, and so you have this uh, grace, and then you have over here work salvation. Now, there are some people in this false doctrine of works salvation who are right on the edge. And they're like, no, we understand that it's all the grace of God. We understand that you got to have faith in Jesus, or else you can't be saved. And guess what? The Catholics teach that. Right. Yeah. The Catholics will tell you, oh, well, you got faith is the most important. Yeah. I don't know how many times I've knocked on the door and said, what do you got to do? And they said, well, you got to have faith in, in Jesus. You know, I've heard all kinds of answers. I had one that said, you got to believe in the Father and the Son and the Virgin Mary. <laughs> That's the Holy Trinity, I guess, right? I've heard some weird answers from Catholics, but a lot of them said, well, faith is the main thing. And then God knows the heart, and, and but faith is the main thing. 
And I said, well, doesn't a person have to be baptized? Oh, yeah, well, they have to be baptized. Well, don't they have to, you know, uh, go to confession? Uh, oh, yeah, they, they got to confess their sins. But don't they have to take the Eucharist, right? You got to eat, eat the blood and uh, eat the flesh and drink the blood, right? So, oh, definitely, you got to do that to be saved. I'm like, how can you say on one hand it's all about faith? Then on the other hand, say, well, if you don't do the works, then you're not going to be saved. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So they might, it sounds like, hey, faith, yeah, you get me saved by faith. But then they're adding works. And any works added to yourself as part of your salvation is a false gospel. Right. right. It's got to be all grace and all through, you know, putting faith uh, in what Jesus says. I mean, how many times in the book of John does he say, believe? Whosoever shall believe, right? And over and over he just talks about belief. So, so as I read this, you'll see that in some parts of this, it sounds like, man, I mean, I think what he's saying is right on. But if you start reading between the lines and go a little bit further, you're thinking, man, he's totally, this is work salvation. So let me read to you this, the, this article is called, uh, What is Lordship Salvation? It's a little lengthy, so bear with me, but I'm going to just read, read this to you. And, and then this is what we're going to build this series, you know, uh, Lord willing, this is what we're going to build this series off of. Is basically what he's saying. And he gives a whole lot of scripture. So I want to deal with those scriptures because obviously if he's leaning on, leaning on these scriptures and this is what people are hearing, and this is what is confusing them about salvation. We want to know what those scriptures say. And if he's right, I want to know that. But I know that he's wrong. <laughs> right? And I've already looked at these uh, verses and uh, he takes them out of context and all that. But let me just read it to you. And I'm going to try not to give too much commentary while I'm reading. The doctrine of lordship salvation teaches that submitting to Christ as Lord goes hand in hand with trusting in Christ as Savior. Lordship salvation is the opposite of what is sometimes called easy believism or the teaching that salvation comes through an acknowledgement of a certain set of facts. John MacArthur, I told you he's going to quote him a lot. John MacArthur, whose book, The Gospel According to Jesus, lays out the case for Lordship salvation, summarizes the teaching this way. This is a quote from John MacArthur. The gospel call to faith presupposes that sinners must repent of their sins and yield to Christ's authority. Wow. In other words, now this is the author talking. Uh, in other words, a sinner who refuses to repent is not saved, for he cannot cling to his sin and the Savior at the same time. And a sinner who rejects Christ's authority in his life does not have saving faith, for true faith encompasses a surrender to God. Thus, the gospel requires more than making an intellectual decision or mouthing a prayer. The gospel message is a call to discipleship. The sheep will follow their shepherd in submissive obedience. I'm going to deal with all this at some point. Most of you guys are already thinking the scriptures and you're thinking how, how wicked that is, but we want to take it step by step, okay? All right, he continues, advocates of Lordship Salvation point to Jesus' Jesus's repeated warnings to the religious hypocrites of his day as proof that simply agreeing to spiritual facts does not save a person. There must be a heart change. Now, I, I would, I would, all right, I'm not giving commentary, I'm just going to read. Jesus emphasizes the high cost of discipleship. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. By the way, he does not use King James Version, so this is going to be, uh, uh, these are going to be all mis, you know, perversions of the scripture. Luke 14, 27. And those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Verse 32. In the same passage, Jesus speaks of counting the cost. Elsewhere, he stresses total commitment. Total commitment. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Luke 9, 62 of the false part. I don't know, ESV or NIV, something like that. And again, this the title of the message is The Hypocrisy of Lordship Salvation Crown. I hope you're already catching on to some of it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that eternal life is a narrow path found by only a few. Matthew 7, 14. In contrast, easy believism seeks to broaden the path so that anyone who has a profession of faith can enter. Jesus says that every good tree bears fruit. In contrast, easy believism says 
that a tree can still be good and bear nothing but bad fruit. Jesus says that many who say, Lord, Lord, will not enter the kingdom. I cannot believe he uses that passage. <laughs> Jesus says that many who say, Lord, Lord, will not enter the kingdom. In contrast, easy believism teaches that saying, Lord, Lord, is good enough. Lordship salvation teaches that, a, and this is this is like junk. <laughs> <laughs> This is what a lot of people believe, right? Even Baptists are falling into that. They think, oh yeah, there's a lot of that makes a lot of sense. I've heard people, people that I love dearly and trust, uh, you know, for a lot of things, who have quoted some of these verses out of the Bible in the same kind of context. Like, well, you gotta do that, or, or you know, is somebody really saved if they don't do that? The Bible says. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, so I'm not done. <laughs> Lordship salvation teaches that a true profession of faith will be backed up by... Now, look, I'm not in agreement with everything in this paragraph, but this paragraph, if you read it, if you didn't read anything else and read this, you'd think, you know, he's got some good points there. All right, It's not that bad. But when you read this in context of everything else I'm reading, you see, like, like this is, this is like flip-flopping back and forth. Lordship salvation teaches that a true profession of faith will be backed up by evidence of faith. If a person is truly following the Lord then he or she will obey the Lord's instructions. A person who is living in willful, unrepentant sin has obviously not chosen to follow Christ because Christ calls us out of sin. Actually, that's not the prayer that I was thinking. I don't agree with this one at all. <laughs> Into righteousness. Indeed, the Bible clearly teaches that faith in Christ will result in a changed life. This is the, verse I was, the, the paragraph I was talking about. Lordship salvation is not a salvation by works doctrine. It is. Okay. But let's just say that this is where the, par the, par the whole article started. It's not a salvation by works doctrine. Advocates of lordship salvation are careful to say that salvation is by grace alone. <laughs> that believers are saved before their faith ever produces any good works. And that Christians can and do sin. However, true salvation will inevitably lead to a changed life. Yeah, a minute ago he said total submission. <laughs> the saved will be dedicated to their Savior. A true Christian will not feel comfortable living in unconfessed, unforsaken sin. There's a little bit of truth in that, I think. Here are nine teachings that set lordship salvation apart from easy believism. For the sake of time, I'm thinking about cutting it off there. I mean, isn't that enough? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> These nine, the, the, the nine, uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to, to not read all this for the sake of time, but the nine different points here is where he's just backed up tons of scripture. Okay, so we want to look at those scriptures in time uh, because that's the important part. And I will address a few of them in the lesson tonight. But what I want to talk about, like I said, is the hypocrisy of the Lordship Salvation crowd. Okay, now, Straw man arguments are made on both sides. You know, we just assume, you know, everybody that teaches this, you know, believes a certain thing. And the Lordship Salvation crowd says everybody who doesn't believe like us is easy believism. And then they define easy believism as somebody who just gets somebody to pray and they didn't really mean it or anything like that. And I'm saying, well, well OK, that's a lot different than what you're saying. Like they didn't produce the fruits and they didn't totally commit themselves to God. And, and then all the verses that you're using confirm that that's exactly what you mean. Somebody has to do to be saved. So it's kind of like, are you really are you are you you're not going to be completely honest or are you just that confused or you don't understand that what you're teaching is a works based salvation? OK, and I think uh, it's a little of both. I think, I think sometimes they're confused. You know, but what does that scripture mean? You know, and, and so then they, they, they don't instead of trying to figure it out, they just say, well, here's what it is. Lordship salvation is the right way now, or something. I don't know. Or dispensationalism. I mean, let's just come up with some kind of doctrine that people believe that will give an answer to why these scriptures are kind of hard to understand without just studying the context, comparing scripture to scripture and figuring out what these things mean. So we want to look at that. But I want to point out just two things in this message, two areas in which you can really see the hypocrisy. And we need to you need to look for it, really when somebody starts teaching this kind of stuff and look for the hypocrisy. First one is this. The Lordship Salvation crowd claims that God does the work of convicting and saving. Number one, for, for the most part, 
This lordship salvation doctrine comes straight out of Calvinism. All right. Now, I'm not saying everyone that teaches a form of lordship salvation, remember, that word salvation uh, uh, spectrum is, is wide. Okay. It's, there's a lot of different teachings in there. And these guys are going to say, oh, no, 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 I'm not Calvinist. Right. But that's where a lot of it comes from. So these guys, John MacArthur and whoever wrote this article, I don't remember the guy's name. These guys are Calvinists. All right. They believe that it's all God's working. Yeah. And, you know, your salvation, you really don't have a choice. God's, that's, God's just going to be the one who, uh, who instills that in you. Okay, so here's what they, they, they claim, that God does the work of convicting and saving. But then at the same time, they claim that soul winners like us, easy believism crowd, are sending people to hell. <laughs> Do you see the hypocrisy? Oh, God does all the work. You know, you can't make that happen at their door by, you know, getting them to say a prayer or whatever. God has to draw them. You know? And God's going to do the work in the heart. That's the gift of God. He draws them unto salvation. You can't do it. And I'm thinking, well, how am I sending anybody to hell if they if God just hasn't drawn them yet? Right. Yeah. Right. So, number one, let me just say this. Their idea of easy believism is grossly exaggerated. And they set up these straw men. It's like, well, you just... Say, lead them in a prayer, right? And you don't even care if they, yeah, let me, let me see. Uh, here's part of that conversation that I had on Facebook. He said, uh, he said, yes, but let me see here. I said, because, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but, but he said, uh, he said that people, he believes people can come forward to the altar and get saved, right? At the end of a service, they can come forward and get saved. Uh, so that's what I asked him because he was saying, I don't think, uh, uh, he said years ago, because he said, I used to believe just like you did. I used to soul win just like you do. He said years ago, you give me a New Testament and 15 minutes with somebody, I could have them saying a prayer. God broke my heart about that one day. And I said, can someone come to the altar and get saved? And he said, yes, but there has to be Holy Spirit conviction. When I knock on the door and give the gospel to someone at the door, couldn't there be Holy Ghost conviction in their heart? Amen. <laughs> Uh, just I don't understand what the problem is. He said, hopefully God will open your eyes one day before uh, you lead too many to be too full children of hell. Oh. I'm like, they're already they're already going to hell, apparently, right? And so I'm giving them the gospel, the message of God. This is what the Bible says. I'm quoting you scriptures from the Bible, how you can be saved. And I'm making them too full ch <laughs> the child of hell. No, this is, uh, it would actually be uh, uh, hypocritical to say that because really they're the ones that are leading people in to believe a works-based salvation. Right. And even if they can actually convince me they don't really believe in a works-based salvation, that's what they're leading people to believe. Well, if there's no works, if I didn't produce any work, if I wasn't good enough, maybe I wasn't really saved and they're just living this whole life making the standard of their salvation how much work they produce. Right. By definition, that's a works-based salvation. Yep, right. Amen. So they they create the straw man that easy believe is like we're just going knocking on the door. What's another quote, quote that he said? He said, uh, uh, let me see here. Oh, uh, what was it? He was uh, it's a super straw man. Do you believe these people? Oh, this isn't even it, but I got to read this one. <laughs> Do you believe these people on Facebook? That have one I love Jesus post to every ten carnal, worldly ten carnal worldly posts are saved because they said a prayer somewhere along the along the way. Then he said, I find this all very confusing, being saved out of a lifestyle that I was. I'll get to that here in a minute. I shouldn't have read that one. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Uh, okay, he says. Uh, uh, let's see here. Here's here's what he's he's summarizing he, what, what the kind of soul winning we do. Do you believe you're a sinner? Yep. Well, then say this prayer after me, believing it in your heart. Come on. So I told him. I said, I, I wish you'd go soul winning with us so you can yeah, see right. what we're doing, right? And uh, he's like, Well, it's not like we don't give the gospel out. And I asked him, Well, well, how, what? How do you do that? Because he said, You know, it's not like people aren't getting saved. We got two people got saved. Some are waiting to get baptized next week. Like, well, how are they getting saved? Well, some, you know, heard some preaching. Some it was one-on-one. -on -one. Some it was, 
you know, they read a tract or something. <laughs> I don't actually, he didn't say that about the tracts, but he said, he said he believes that people can get saved by tracts. In fact, he said in this quote, you can, I can show it to you. He said, he said, I believe sometimes I would trust, I would trust that somebody gets saved reading a tract more than I would by these people that are not going to buy them. <laughs> that's crazy, man. That's, that's just, that's, that's a total misrepresentation of what, we're doing when we give the gospel. Now, I don't know what he used to do. He says, I used to be just like you. Well, I'm not like that. Right? Right. I don't know how you used to give the gospel, but that ain't how I give the gospel. Amen. But the point is this. Uh, if if it's the work of God, why criticize anybody you know, who's evangelizing? But first of all, I don't think that that's what the gift of God's talking about. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we're all familiar with it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Well, you know what a Calvinism a Calvinist does with that verse? Is they'll say, see, it's the gift of God. Your faith is the gift of God. Like you can't, you can't have faith. You, you can't put your faith in Christ unless God gives you that faith. And then you will just naturally call on him. And I'm thinking, well, why do we even have to give the gospel? Why do you have to get up there and preach the gospel? Why do we have to do anything if God's just going to do it? Right? And if that is the case, even if that was true, what's wrong with us knocking on doors? Can't God use us knocking on doors in this way, given the gospel? That we, why do we have to try to make somebody cry and repent of their sins? That's not salvation, first of all. Right. <laughs> and then why, why would we have to do that if God's just going to naturally do that with them? Okay, but Ephesians 2, 8, 9, what it's saying is that we can't do anything. Uh, it's, it's the gift of God. There's nothing we can do by which we're going to get credit from it that we can brag and boast and say, hey, look how good I am. I'm so much better than that sinner over there. Right, right. Which is exactly what people are doing when they say, well, he's not really saved because he doesn't act like me. Yeah. Right. Well, what makes you the standard of salvation? Right. <laughs> what makes you the standard? Like, well, if you live like me, you can be saved. Right. And of course they would say that. Oh, I don't believe that at all. But that's exactly what they're saying. Look at 2 Timothy 2, 25. Here's another verse that was quoted in that article from gotquestions.org. 2 Timothy 2.25. And they're saying this is it's the work of God. And here's what it says. In meekness, let me back up. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strives. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And here's the, the part of the verse that they're trying to quote here. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of truth. And so they say, see, here, God's going to give them the repentance. They're just naturally going to repent of their sins. God gives that to them. It's a gift of God. This is what he says in the article, right? And I didn't read that far in it, but that's what he says. Okay, but here's, here's the thing about that. Let's read that again, verse 25. In Okay, let's back up even. Gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that impose themselves. Is he demonstrating anything here other than the words that are coming out of his mouth and explaining to them the gospel and instructing to them? Uh, in fact, look what it says. That he might give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Somebody has to acknowledge the truth before they can be saved. Okay, and so he's saying uh, uh, he's saying that you know that's the job of a servant of God to try to bring somebody to understanding what the truth is. Okay, so he picks up on that word repentance and makes that believe, makes that mean what he wants it to mean. But there's a couple of different ways you can look at that. I'm not, I'm not trying right now to break down this verse and give some kind of a, a textual message on it, but. But there's a couple of things you can look at this. Number one, if God's granting repentance, it could be a way of saying that God is the one who's repenting. OK, because what he's saying is, hey, that person right now in their condition, they don't believe the truth in their condition. They're going to die and go to hell. My wrath is upon them. They're not my children. And all of a sudden that person now has the acknowledging of truth. And God repents of that, of, of the way he was you know, condemning that person uh, to hell. That's a possibility. Okay. Or the other thing is that the repentance is just talking about the fact that they, uh, they are turning to God and God is accepting 
their, that relationship. You may, the repentance doesn't have to mean right there that God's just causing them that they repent of all their sins. There's no reason to believe that. There's so many other explanations of what that could uh, what that could mean. But he was picking up on that one little phrase and making it mean something uh, that I think is really bizarre. God granting repentance could be based on the is based on the preaching of the gospel and them making a decision to believe the gospel and to seek a change in their standing before God. There's nothing in that verse that talks about them making a change in their life for salvation. Okay, it's all about being convinced that what they're believing was wrong. Also, what about John six twenty nine? John 6, 29, you see, they keep saying, no, 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 it's the work of God. You can't get somebody saved. It's the work of God. And that's the, the phrase that keeps being used. John 6, 29. So here's the part uh, where Jesus is giving this uh, uh, little speech here, and he's talking about how he is the manna that came down, and, and, he's, and he's telling them all these things, and then uh, he says, uh, uh, let me see, he says, labor for that uh, that meat. He says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. And they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? See, they're in line thinking, he says, labor for the meat that God's going to give you. And they're thinking, okay, what is that work I need to do? What, how, how can I earn that? How can I earn salvation? Isn't that what everybody wants to do is earn their salvation? And here's what he says. He answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him who hath, he hath sent. Amen. Amen. You believe it. That's the work that God wants you to do. So there you go, guys. Works-based salvation. <laughs> here's the one work that you need to do to please God. You need to believe in his son. <laughs> that's what the Bible says. Right. If you believe on him, that's that's work. But you know what? It's as much work as opening up a Christmas gift on Christmas morning and ripping off the paper right. and saying, This is my gift. Oh, it's for it, man. You had to open up the, you had to open it up. <laughs> that's as foolish as somebody drowning and you throw them a life preserver, and then after you pull them out of the water, they're like, man. Did you see how good I held on to that life preserver? Man, I, I saved myself. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, okay? There's nothing you can do to get credit for salvation. It's a free gift. Amen. Okay? And so uh, it's crazy that anybody would say anything else, but they're trying to say, no, it's the work of God. Now, that's a Calvinistic point of view, but they're saying, hey, God's already got the elect out there. They're going to believe, and they're going to just do the works. And if they didn't do the works, then they weren't part of the elect. And that's really where that where that teaching comes from. But what's crazy is that the same crowd will acknowledge salvations at the altar or in the back room in a church building, but will not acknowledge the numbers of people reached door to door. My preacher friend asked me. Let me see here. He said... Are you of the mindset? No, that's not the right one. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but he asked, uh, do you think you could go out there? Uh, man, I should have I should have marked this a little bit better. There he goes. So you stand by it that you can go out in an afternoon knocking doors and lead three or four people to Christ. <laughs> I said, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and we have done that several times. Amen. You know, how many people got saved in your church last week? Two of them? Do you really believe somebody can listen to you preach the gospel from the pulpit and get saved? <laughs> I don't know what they think we're doing, right? But I know what they're saying is, no, 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 that can't happen because you need to watch and you need to see. Uh, you know, and we had this conversation on the way up there, like, like, well, well, maybe the thing is, well, yeah, yeah, but you don't understand. See, you're getting people saved out there. You're claiming to get people saved, and then they're not even coming to church. But see, this person came to church, and so we believe he's probably saved. Yeah, well, how did he come to church? What made him come to church? Promotions. Hey, we're going to do this. Hey, won't you come to this big day? We're gonna, they do the things, everything they can to draw people into the into the church, right? And so then they try to uh, preach the message, and they give an emotional altar call at the end, and they come forward. And they said, oh, man, I'm so glad you came forward. Let's go back here, and I'll give you the gospel, right? And then they say, oh, yeah, that person got saved. 
But going on, and, and, and by the way, people can only sing just as I am so many verses. <laughs> so I know this from experience that if you're in the back room trying to lead someone to the Lord, you're like, man, I got like five minutes. I got to get through this real quick. <laughs> right? When we're at their door, how many of you guys, 20 minutes, 30 minutes sometimes? Amen. I mean, we always say, like, can I just take 10 minutes to share? But then when they're open and receptive and they're asking you questions, you're like, okay, they obviously don't mind if we take some more time. So it becomes 20 minutes, 30 minutes, right? right. They are not in that back room spending 30 minutes giving the gospel and explaining things. They're like, all right, they already came forward. We got to give them this to, to do something. I don't even know. Like, do they lead them in a prayer or what? I don't know, but... Uh, but and then he's like, hey, well, then we'll get them baptized. And if they get baptized, I guess they think that that's evidence that they got saved or something. But uh, but it's interesting to me and hypocritical that they think that, you know, their way they can get people saved. But knocking on door, you know, going door to door by by twos, you know, kind of like Jesus said to do, you know, that's right. <laughs> going house to house. Like Paul said, he does. You know, you know that, that, that ain't going to work. <laughs> It's crazy. We believe in preaching privately in the church. Amen? Amen. I don't give a, a salvation message every time because I just assume the people getting here are saved. Now, if somebody came uh, into the building and suspected wasn't saved, I might bring up salvation in the message, you know, just kind of work that in. But, you know, I'm quite confident that there's guys in this room that would ask them before they left the building, you know, hey, so tell me about how you got saved. But if you walk into uh, the majority of churches out here, and you ask one of their members, hey, tell me how you got saved. They would say, hey, quit harassing our members. You right. shouldn't harass yeah. them like that. Yeah. You know, you're putting them in a bad pr predicament. Yeah. yeah, kind of like when we knocked on the door earlier and the lady said, I don't feel comfortable talking to you about that. I mean, she just said she was spiritual. She believed in God. I said, well, what do you think somebody should do to go to heaven? I don't feel comfortable talking to you about that. Why? Well, I, I don't know why, but that's pretty good evidence that you're not saved. <laughs> So if I am talking to church members and saying, hey, tell me about how you got saved. I don't feel comfortable talking to you about that. My, my thought is they must not be saved because right. let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. I don't want to tell people about my salvation, right? And so uh, uh, so I don't have a problem with that. In fact, I encourage that. If somebody comes in, you don't know if they're saved or not, ask them how they know. Because I am pretty certain that people in here are saved. Now, somebody could have deceived me. <laughs> I'm sure that it... Uh, you're saved, and so uh, so we can take care of that. But look, the majority of the people that are in here are saved, and so they need to be taught other things from the Bible, not salvation all the time. Right. Okay, but not only do we preach privately in here to our members, but then we go out, like Jesus said, "Go ye into all the world." We leave the building, we go, and we take the gospel to other people. And there's two different ways we can do that. We can do that house to house, which is our main method that we enjoy doing and we want to do. It seems pretty to make a lot of sense. Hey, at some point, people are going to be home uh, in Iola. We're kind of like, in a way, I mean, we've probably missed some doors, but kind of starting like a third time around, a lot of streets in Iola. And every time I'm thinking, man, people are going to be sick of us uh, of us knocking on their doors. But then I realized that, you know, not everyone when we knock on the door, are they home? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if I knocked on the door a year ago, it's not, what's it hurting for me to knock again? Just a reminder, you know, that we're there asking them again. I haven't ran into any problems where they're like, will you quit knocking on my door? And you knocked on my door a year ago. I don't have any problem with that. So so we we like the idea of going house to house, right? Now I realize it could be going house to house to talk to some members and have Bible studies or something like that. But I think the principle throughout the Bible is very clear that they went out preaching the gospel house to house. And then the other thing is we preach, the, we preach publicly, okay? Now, the way that looks a lot of times in this uh, in, in this in, in this uh, time uh, of history is social media, you know, getting the gospel out however you can. Maybe you can go uh, a lot of foreign fields. You can get into the schools and you can preach publicly to a bunch of uh, to a big audience or or you can go in the malls or you can go down where there's a lot of people sitting. Uh, you can go to the park. Right. If, uh, if people don't get too mad at you <laughs> and you can give the gospel to people in the park publicly and from house to house. Right. Now here's the problem. Let's go there. Acts 2020. Acts 2020. So in my conversation with my preacher friend, he said, uh, what do you think about Acts 2021? 
Now, I just quoted you Acts 20, 20. And we're preaching the gospel, right? And here's what it says in Acts 20. I'll read verse 20 and 21. It says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house. And then he says this, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, What do you believe about Acts 20, 21? You know why he asked me that? Because it has the word repentance in it. And here is what the, the Lordship Salvation crowd teaches. And if you don't believe it, look up something, if you can stomach it, from Ray Comfort. And him giving the gospel to somebody, he says, Now, there's two things you need to do to be saved, okay? You need to repent of your sins, right? Because he just spent all this time uh, telling them that they're wicked sinners going to hell because they've broken all the Ten Commandments and they're rotten. And, and, uh, and, and, and they are, right? We're all sinners, that's for sure. In God's eyes, people do need to know they're sinners. They need to know that, hey, in their current condition, they're going to hell. But then he says, now there's two things. This is the gospel, right? The good news. Two things you need to do. You need to repent of all your sins, which he means stop doing them. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure he'll say, oh, no, everybody's still going to sin sometimes. But he just told that person that if you want to be saved, you need to quit doing the sins. You need to turn from that. They don't understand what he means by that. Right. And so he tells them that. And then he might slip in there a little bit later into his presentation right before they leave oh you also have to believe in jesus christ yeah <laughs> so they literally are saying there's two things you need to do now some will say it's some will say it happens at the same time you've ever heard that like two sides of the same coin like like if you're repenting of your sin if you're turning to god you're repenting of your sins and so he's saying uh, uh this verse it means that somebody has to repent of their sins well let's look at that real quick acts chapter 20 verse 21 testifying both to the Jews and also, again, I'm, let me give you a couple possibilities. I'm not trying to break this down right now. We will we will later look at it care, uh, more carefully. There's a couple of thoughts about this, okay? And any of these verses that seem confusing to somebody uh, in regards to repentance and, hey, maybe maybe we, we do need to do the works or else we're not saved, or, or maybe we do need to stop sinning and, and, and just interpret repenting that way. Here's a couple of different things to consider, okay? Number one, notice he says this, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he could be saying this. What, now, it's a little bit out of order, but it makes sense. A Gentile who's just been living in idolatry, pagan paganism, just believing whatever it is they want to believe, right? That Gentile, whenever he was preaching Jesus and who God is, because, hey, Jesus said, uh, you know, if, if you... Uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he says, no man come to my Father but by me, right? And so so Jesus is clearly, we understand, probably they're teaching just the flat-out Trinity, you know, if you, you got to believe. And so they're understanding that as God. And he's, and they're re repenting towards God. In other words, you need to turn from those idols. You need to repent. You need to believe in Jesus Christ. Maybe he's saying that to the Gentiles and to the Jews, which guess what? They should have already been looking forward, the, forward to the Messiah coming, Right? They should have already been looking forward to him. In fact, people were saved in the Old Testament through faith, just like we are in the New Testament. And by faith, they believed that this Messiah was coming. Now, this was an awkward period of time in the book of Acts because Jesus Christ was actually here. And some of the Jews were having a hard time uh, hearing about him and knowing that he was the one and deciding whether they should trust him or not. So it could be that what he's saying is, uh, is testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, the, the Jews would have had to realize that, hey, my faith in the coming Messiah uh, can't just be in some, I can't reject Christ. I need to accept by faith that the Christ was the one. And like I said, that was an awkward time. And I believe whenever that verse is quoted where it says, my sheep, no, my boy, he just got done saying, all these guys that are coming and, and claiming to be the Messiah, they're, they're thieves and robbers, and they've come forth to steal, right? And then he says, my sheep yep. hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And he's taught, and he's exposing false prophets in that passage, brother Justin read before the message, and, they, and he's saying that these are false prophets. He says you know them by their fruits, and he yep. says not everybody that comes and says, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name and that in your name. Uh, not not everyone's going to heaven, right? But those that do the will of my Father, right? We know what the will of the Father was that we believe on on, on the Son, Amen. Jesus Christ. And then he says, I'll say, depart from me, for I never knew you. How could they take that verse and make it, uh, you mean, you know, hey, you can't get to heaven just by believing. 
you got to get the works because not everyone that says Lord, Lord, and just stop right there. But those people in Matthew chapter five, seven are saying, Lord, Lord, I've done this in your name. I've done many wonderful works. Do you know that people could believe in the wrong God? They could be atheists. They could deny Christ. They could they could just be totally uh, on their way to hell, and they could change their life and turn over a new leaf and appear to be quite holy. Right? We know a lot of religious people. You see on excuse me on TV or or maybe you met her, and, and they might be able to produce what looks like good fruit, but it's not good fruit, right? Jesus will at the end say, I never knew you. Depart from you. So the question is, well, how does somebody come? How does he, how does he know somebody? And he's made that clear. When we trust in him, then we're born again at that time. Right? Not just saying a random prayer where we don't believe anything because we got to believe with our heart, right? With the man believeth uh, in the heart uh, unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so it's got to be real in the heart. I agree with that. But that doesn't mean that it has anything to do with my works. And so uh, 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 so I got way off track here. But anyway, uh, repentance toward God, faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ also could just be simply saying this. Look, when a person truly turns to God, they will naturally put their faith in Christ. And so it's saying both of them, you know, re uh, repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. These two are the same thing. You know, you're turning to the true God. You're putting your faith in Christ, you know. I'm probably, I might be making it too difficult with the Jew and the Gentile thing, but I'm just saying there's there, there, there's no reason why you have to take that verse out of context and make that about, hey, you got to do the works and repent of all your sins and all that kind of stuff. All right, it's been too long on that one. Let's move on here. Let me read these two verses to you. John 12, 32. He says, Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Right. In first Corinthians uh, uh, one, we see uh, we got to turn there. Let's look at first Corinthians one. First Corinthians one. Verse 17. This is Paul preaching here, and he says, I, and I baptize, uh, let me see here, sorry. And I baptize also the house of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptize any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He's not trying to win them over through fancy preaching and trying to, uh, use logic and reasoning, and hey, you can't win an atheist by art, by debating with them about the uh, the different uh, uh, artifacts and all that kind of stuff. You're probably not going to work because that because it's not it's not our words that are powerful in the matter. Okay, and so so he said, I didn't come to you with words uh, with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Right? If if I could win you over with just my own logic and reasoning, why did Christ have to die? Right? It wouldn't be of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Believe what? Believe in that message that was being preached, that Christ died on the cross. You ever talk to someone that just refuses to believe the gospel, and they're like, why did he die? That's just weird. Why would he have to come back? Why would God send his son to be died? I mean, who made that story up? And they just don't get it, right? But those who just come to faith, they put their faith in that, and they say, man, I, I believe that, right? It's, it's foolishness to them that don't believe, but to them that believe, it's the power of God uh, unto salvation. Uh, let me see here. Uh, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, 
both, and I'm not, this is not uh, getting Calvinism, uh, Calvinistic here, right? Uh, but those who have, have been called, right, and God's foreknowledge, he understands that some are going to reject and some are going to, uh, uh, some are going to believe. It doesn't mean he predestined them to do that, but he knows they're going to, okay? And the called or the elect is all talking about the same people, and that's simply this, those who are going to believe. All right, so don't don't interpret that to say like, hey, he's only calling some people. All right, the the ones who he calls everybody, he's if he's lifted up, he draws all men to himself, and uh, and he says uh, those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, amen, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are uh, which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You know, I'm not going to stand before God and say, well, look what I did, God. I'm going to say, man, well, look what Christ did for me. That's how I got to heaven. He died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again for me. He paid the penalty of my sins. That's what's going to get me into heaven. I'm not going to say, look at my great works, okay? Amen. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, uh, who, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorify, glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's keep reading just a couple more verses. And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with exceed excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's right. He didn't go looking for the fruit. I don't care. I don't need to know about all your sins. I don't need to know if, if, if you, I don't need to watch you after you say you believe in the gospel and see if you're going to produce fruit or not. I came out to see him. I don't care about anything except this. Do you believe in Christ crucified, buried, res, risen again? <laughs> He's the son of God. I mean, this is the gospel. The gospel isn't like, let me see your works. Let me see your fruit. Total opposite. Right. Total opposite. Anybody who's leaning that direction towards a workspace salvation if they're not already flat out heretics, they're headed that way. Right? Right. They, they have yeah. got to realize your works plays no part before salvation or after salvation. Salvation is simply believing the gospel. Not, not just acknowledging a set of facts. That's what they keep saying, easy believing. You just got to acknowledge a set of facts. Well, yeah, if that acknowledgement is truly in the heart, right? The Bible even talks, uses the word acknowledge, yeah. right? But it's got to be something that's in the heart. It's not just here. I've heard it said this way. Some people, you ever heard this? Some people miss hell by 12 inches, right? Right. They got a head knowledge, but not a heart knowledge. I, I, I can accept that. Somebody can sit there and say they believe in Jesus. They know he was born of a virgin. They understand this. They understand. They can say they believe that, but haven't really received that. I, I, see, I see evidence of that in the Bible. And so we obviously they have to believe it with all our heart, right? But how are they going to believe that? Because we preach the word of God to them. And Amen. they believe by faith in the message. Not that you have to turn from all your sins and do works to please God. That has nothing to do with your salvation. You have to believe in Christ. And so, uh, uh, anyway, let me jump down to the next, uh, for the sake of time, I just need to, I need, I need to move on here. But the next part is this. Lordship salvation, the Lordship salvation crowd, here's the hypocrisy. They claim that one will totally follow Christ if they are saved. But they don't totally follow Christ in every area of their life. Now, they maybe they're going to claim that they will, but they probably won't. You know why? Because they are very uh, humble. <laughs> and they don't want, you know, they would never say, well, yeah, look at my life. I'm, I'm, I'm righteous and holy. No, what they're going to say is, oh, I'm just a meek and, and a lowly sinner. I'm, I'm worse than anybody. You ever heard someone say, right. I'm worse than anybody. Man, when God saved me, I realized how much of a scum I was. And I just am the low of the low. If you only knew all the terrible things I've done, all right, that's a false humility. What they're doing is they're bragging about their good works. I've right. repented of my sins. 
Look how good I changed. I, I turned over a new leaf. In fact, I'm so righteous now. Look how humble I am. <laughs> look how lowly I am. <laughs> it's false, right? I want to know what comes out of your mouth. How do you get saved? And if they say, well, you just got to stop sinning, they're not saved. Amen. Right? Yep. If they say, you just got to trust in Jesus and what he did for us. Mm -hmm. Hey, I don't care how wicked that person is. If he said that, I have more faith in him being saved than the guy that said, well, you got to turn from all your sins. Right. Right. Because right? there's wicked people out there that know they're wicked. And they say, praise the Lord that Jesus died for my sins and I don't have to go to hell. Even though I'm, I'm addicted to this substance and I'm having a hard time over here and my life is falling apart and, and I just can't seem to, to get the victory over sin. But thank God Jesus died for me. Thank God, you know, it's not my works that gets me to heaven. I'm going to be like, man, that guy's saved. Man. Right. Then you got this other guy here. No, I'm just the worst of the worst, man. I, I mean, I know he's a dirty, rotten sinner, but. But, you know, I have anger problems and and I'm just so, you know, man, there's probably sins of that person, unconfessed sins that that person, you'll never, he'll never tell you that. But maybe his wife and kids knows <laughs> it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy because everybody's wicked. We're all vile sinners. Some of us, praise the Lord, have gotten far enough. Now, look, when the day I got saved. I was more righteous than a lot of grown men who've been saved for many years. You know why? Because I was a little kid and I had good parents who kept me out of trouble for the most part. And so naturally, I just didn't do those things. It was pretty easy for me to, 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 to repent of my sins. I didn't have that many right? that were obvious. Obviously, we're all sinners. But then you get this other guy who's lived a lifetime of sin and now he believes in the gospel. But guess what? He's got addictions. Guess what? He's got all this baggage hanging over his life. It's a lot easier for him to fall back into sin. And you can't be raised in church your whole life, which some of these guys are. Not all. Some of them came from a bad past. This guy, the, the preacher I was talking to, did. In fact, he said, he said, well, I just can't believe that life's not going to change, you know, based on the experience of my life changing. So what's that mean? I'm relying on my change to get me to heaven. Right. And that is and that's just wicked. Now, I hope that he's saved and he's just confused. And look, there are some times you've been saved for a while. You've got life cleaned up, man. You're trying to follow the Lord. You, be, you become a disciple, which I don't have time to get into it. But being a disciple is not part of salvation. Right. Being a disciple is a lifelong pro, uh, process and a project after salvation. Okay. But after you've been living a life of discipleship for a long time and you've got to get your life right and you're kind of uh, 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 getting uh, uh, just walking with the Lord better. Doesn't it get easy to just look at people who, who haven't been through that process and they're falling back into sin and you say, man, I just, how did that person save? How can they do that? Until you remember, oh yeah, I did this. Oh, I fall into this sin. It might not be his sin, but it's a sin because we all have this human flesh. So we can't rely on that uh, as, an, as an answer. Discipleship does not equal salvation. I'm going to show you just two verses on that real quick. I've probably shared these before, but these are things that help me to uh, to consider this because I've had a lot of people use verses as as I read some of them, I think. And if I haven't, there's going to be a lot of them in that article from uh, gotquestions.org. He uses all the verses that Jesus preaches about discipleship. And he says, and he says, look, you know, lordship, salvation, you can't be saved because he said there, if you don't do this, you can't be my disciple. If you don't forsake everything, you can't be my disciple. And I'm thinking, have you forsaken everything? Are you really saying that you're living like the disciples lived to follow Christ? Uh, are you living just like Christ lived? No, you're not. And that would be hypocrisy for you to say that you are. Right. So this is what they say, Matthew chapter 5. And I like this verse, and there's a lot of places that we can see this, but this is a, a, a clear place. <clears throat> If you read some of the verses in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, you begin to read some of these uh, 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 verses here, and you think, man, is he saying that if you don't live that way, if you don't live more righteous than the Pharisees and, and, and do all these great works, then you weren't really saved? And so there's a couple ways that you can deal with that. You can just say, huh, maybe that was a different dispensation. Maybe that's for a different dispensation. Like that's for the Jews in the tribulation or something like that. Because look, there's all kind of weird 
interpretations about why these verses don't apply to us. Okay? Or you can say, well, yeah, you got to repent of your sins. You might not do all these works, but you're willing to do all these works. You ever heard that kind of stuff? Just some kind of just some kind of trying to trying to make these pieces fit together. Or you can just read it and realize this. Lots and lots of people follow Jesus. Multitudes of people follow Jesus. He healed many people. Amen. Many people, he said, your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you whole. He, he did a lot of things for all these multitudes. And the Bible even talks about how many, 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 many believed. And I think that means they were saved because the Bible says, who sort of believeth in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But he says, uh, uh, all these followed him. They weren't all disciples. And look here at chapter 5. And seeing the multitudes, these are the ones following along that he's preaching and teaching to. He went up into a mountain, and when he was set, he, uh, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the kingdom of God now. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, I don't have time for it, but those are, those are uh, used interchangeably in the Bible. Okay, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. He's talking about God, which he later will say is in you. Okay, this is not a physical kingdom that he's setting up on earth. He's saying that uh, he's talking about those who are believers, those who are, are that. And he's talking about those who are going to follow him and live the kingdom life. None of us are going to be perfect until, uh, and, until after we're in our glorified bodies. Okay, but he's saying, my disciples, you know, I've got some special things I want to teach you because you're willing to follow me. You're willing to forsake all. And in fact, you know, any man uh, that puts his head to the plow and turning back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Now, Lordship Salvation, the guy's going to say, see, if you turn back, man, you're not saved. If you if you look back, if you want to go take care of your family instead of forsaking all and, and following Christ, you're not saved. Well, then I, I heard a lot of preachers that preach Lordship Salvation that aren't saved now because they didn't forsake their families and leave everything and give up all their money to the poor and sell everything they own and follow Jesus Christ. Right. They didn't do that. And so they're hypocrites if, they, if they're going to say that's what requires uh, somebody uh, to be saved or qualifies them, as A.W. Tozer says. Not everyone agrees with me that full qualification for eternity is not instant or automatic or painless. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, uh, let me see. Acts chapter 5. It is automatic, man. The minute you trust in Christ, call on him to save you, he cleanses you of all sin. Amen. You're qualified for heaven. But on this earth, you're not. If you're not living for Him and following in that way, He's saying, "Man, you're not fit for the kingdom of, of God. You're not fit for uh, the, the, the His ex high expectations for you." But that's a lifetime of discipleship. Acts chapter five, verse eleven. This is right after uh, Ananias and Sapphira die because they lie about giving all their possessions. To the poor and they really held some back and they don't die because they held some back they die because they lied and god was trying to really just stir up some fear and it worked it stirred up a lot of fear in fact so much so that look at verse 11 great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things and by the hand of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people i already talked about continuationism versus uh uh, uh, cessationism. So <laughs> I'm not going to preach that message again. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them, and believers were the more added to the Lord. Wait a minute, I thought you said nobody joined themselves to the church. You know, here's what they'll say. How many of those people, when you knocked on their doors and they said a prayer, and they said that they believe, and you're, you're claiming that they got saved, how many of them were in church the next Sunday? Well, all these people that believed here didn't join themselves to the church. And that's why I love that he doesn't say, as he does in other places, that they're added to the church. What does he say? And the believers were the more added to the Lord, verse 14. Multitudes, both of men and women. Multitudes and multitudes of people that were added to the Lord. But guess what? I'm not going to that church. Did you hear what happened? That guy didn't sell everything he had, and he told a lie, and God wiped him out. I don't want any part of that. Right, right. But they still were added to the Lord. They still were saved. They still believed the gospel. They still 
wanted Christ to be their savior. Amen. So what they'll do is, uh, anyway, let me just close this down here. Let me just stop. Now this, no, not a, not, this is not super important, okay, compared to everything else that I said. But let me just, let me just break it down this way. Let's say that our doctrine, what we teach on salvation, what we practice when we go knock on doors, let's say we don't go far enough. Let's say we're supposed to be preaching, hey, man, you really got to start living for the Lord, repenting of your sins, and doing all that kind of stuff. And, and let's say we were saying that, okay? And some actually, like I said, they believed up here, they didn't believe here. I, I believe a lot of people that we've probably written in that book and said these people got saved probably didn't really. But we don't know that. We can't see their heart. We can just believe what they say. They say that they believed it and confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus, so we believe that they're saved. Okay, we really don't know. We don't know their heart. But let's just say we didn't go far enough, okay? If we're wrong, if we're wrong, we at least introduced them to the gospel. We at least told them, we do tell them before we lead them in prayer. I think everybody does. I know I do. I say, hey, this prayer isn't going to save you. Now, there's no magical prayer. You've got to believe this in your heart. And what you're doing here is just confess with your mouth what you already believe in your heart. Okay, and we try to tell them that. Not everyone's going to get that. I understand, but at the very least, we have introduced them to a pure gospel. If we're wrong, okay. Now, if the other side is 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 right, which they're not, but, but uh, if the other side, uh, I'm sorry, if the other side is wrong, which they are, <laughs> and they're preaching this gospel that's leading people to believe in a works based salvation, who's doing more harm? I mean, if, if we're right and they're wrong, right, uh, the, 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 the possibility of us leading somebody into uh, a damnable heresy, right, uh, we've only introduced them to the pure gospel. Here's what I'm trying to say. If works is required, which it isn't, but if works is required, look, we don't have any part of that. That's got to be something that's going to happen. That's got to be something that God's going to do, right? We're just giving them the gospel. So, so we're at very little risk of, of, of leading somebody into a false gospel, which is what they say. Hey, you're making them too full of the child of hell. You know, you're leading them to a, a false hope and all that. No, we're, we're teaching them the gospel. Okay? But this person over here, if there's any chance that they're wrong, and we know that they're wrong, any chance that they're wrong, when they're telling people uh, that you have to do, oh, you know, that your life is going to change and all these things are going to happen, they are leading people into a false uh, idea that their life is going to radically change and that the works have plays a part of their salvation. I feel like I didn't say that right. <laughs> okay, but just bear with me, okay? If they, if they're if they are uh, teaching people that, and I know they are, and I'll tell you why I know they are, because growing up in the independent Baptist churches, there has been so much confusion on this issue. Okay, and I've seen. Tons, as, as you probably have too, tons of tracks that have the right gospel all the way up until the end. Yep. And in the end, they say, well, just in case I'm wrong. That's like that's the only thing I can figure that they're doing. Just in case I'm wrong, I'm going to put this little section here. Now, you have to be willing to repent of all your sins and turn over, even though they preached all this right. Now, they're, I'm just going to take a chance, just in case I'm not right. And I'm going to put that in there. you got to repent of all your sins. That little bit of, of a possible error which is a great error, but I'm just saying that little bit could make that person never get saved because they're thinking, well, it's all about works. And how do I know if I've repented enough? And how do I know? And they're leading people to help. And I've watched in youth rallies and camps and altar calls where the same person come over and over every year, right? Every couple sermons, they're coming down to the altar again. And they say, hey, I don't think I got saved last time. I've heard, the, I've heard teens say that so many times. I don't think I got saved last time. Well, why don't you think you got saved? Because I just keep falling back into sin. And I have to tell them, well, your, your works don't have anything to do with your salvation. Whether or not you sin is not the basis of your salvation. Your salvation is based on if you believe the gospel. And I've tried to tell them that. And they're just like, uh, like, I don't know, man. I just keep hearing this preaching. And it just says, man, if you're just not... Uh, you're totally repentant, man. If you didn't cry, if there wasn't sorrow, I mean, there's so many different versions of this, but they're saying it's Jesus Christ is totally believing in him. 
but you got to repent of your sins, but you got to sorrow, but you got to be willing to turn from your sins, but you got to. It's that but that's sending people to hell. Amen. And it's that but that's confusing people yep. and making teacher, preachers and teachers that might be saved, but now they're growing up thinking, man, I'm afraid to, to preach the wrong gospel because everybody keeps telling me you got to do this, you got to do that. So then they preach that, sending people to hell. At the very, very worst case scenario, and again, I, I, I know we're not wrong, but at the very, at the, the worst thing that we're, we could possibly be doing is spreading the gospel. Right. <laughs> To people who might not believe it and might th think that they're safe. Guess what? They already think they're safe. They think they're good enough to go to heaven. They think they're worth them. And we might, you know, lead them to the point where they say, oh, yeah, I'm safe. And it's not my work. So I'm safe because I believe in Jesus. And they don't really believe in Jesus. They're just as lost now as they were before. Okay. And so so, so we're, we're really not doing any damage. Here's what we're doing. We're going house and house. We're not trying to convince them with fancy words or wisdom of men. But we're preaching to them. The plain gospel, Christ crucified, right? That's it. What harm are we doing? We're not doing any harm. In fact, I would say the opposite. We're leading people to the Lord, to true salvation, to faith in Jesus Christ. They're sending people to hell. Lord, we pray for your blessings on the service and the message that was preached. I pray that you help me in future lessons to clarify uh, some things as we go through these verses and look at this false doctrine. Pray you help us to continue to lead souls uh, uh, through... Faith in you, like as the Bible's told us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.